You're tuned to 90.5 WICN, Jazz Plus for New England. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Listen online at WICN.org. Good evening. This is The Public Eye, and I'm Al Vona, your host, welcoming you this Sunday evening. Hope you're keeping warm. Uh, at least it's warm here at the studios of WICN, and I hope it's warm where you are as well. You know, as we started off the year, in fact, as we finished off 2014, uh, a debate that has been raging not only in Washington, D.C., but I think across the nation uh, regarding the immigration issue. Um, you know, should we should we cap the amount of immigrants coming into this country? Should we ask those who are here undocumented to leave? Um, what is the issue? What should be some of the proposals? Obviously, it's going back and forth. It's, it, it's really created a wedge between many people in many camps. Um, and after tonight's broadcast, you perhaps will have your own uh, your own philosophy and your own ideas about that. But uh, that is the issue tonight. We'll be talking about that. And my guest is is uh, a man that I had back uh, a couple of years ago and uh, one that we enjoy having on, uh, Phil Cafaro. He's, he's the professor of philosophy at Colorado State University and the author of the new book, How Many is Too Many? Reducing Immigration. Phil, welcome back. Hello, Al. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is a contentious, I mean, and, and I'm using, I guess that's a, a subtle way of putting it, Phil. This is a contentious issue. I mean, I've heard, uh, you know, we, we've heard uh, legislators not only in Washington, D.C., obviously even on the state levels. Uh, states are certainly uh, up in arms depending on where you stand uh, with Washington and vice versa. Uh, the immigration issue, unlike anything you or I have ever seen before, and, uh, and I think uh, you'd agree that this nation certainly was built on immigrants. No one is questioning that. But it was a different time and a different place, and, and, and they, certainly, they certainly worked very hard uh, and endured a lot of hardship to be here. Uh, but today, many people feel that uh, you know, the immigration issue is a little too liberal uh, and, and perhaps giving a little too much. And uh, that, that's where people might mainly stand on that. But let me ask you, uh, obviously this issue um, got under your skin because you decided to write a book about it. Uh, talk about that a little bit. Sure. Uh, I've written a book, How Many is Too Many? The Progressive Argument for Reducing Immigration into the United States. Um, as you say, nobody's arguing that we're not a nation of immigrants, and very few people argue that we should cut off immigration altogether. But the question is, how many people should we be letting into the country each year, and, and who should get to come? And there are lots of different positions on that. My sense is that, uh, unlike a hundred years ago, when we had vast open spaces and we were opening up factories and we needed a lot of unskilled labor, times have changed today. And uh, the needs of the country aren't the same. And our ability to, to find jobs, even for all our own citizens, doesn't seem to be the same as it was even 50 years ago. So I think times have changed. And in the book, I make the argument that immigration policy has to change to fit the new times. Yeah, I noticed that you've, and, and I think a lot of people would perhaps agree with you that, you know, uh, given what we have, given the resources, uh, and I don't think anybody should should be misled here, um, the United States is not uh, a nation, nor is any nation on the face of the earth, limit, uh, ha have any an unlimited resources. We all have limits uh, as to how many people we can absorb, how many people we can actually take care of. And, and you make that um, uh, compelling argument in your book that, you know, all well and good. You know, we can have another 100,000 people come into this country, but do we have the resources to absorb all these people? And will their quality of life be any better than the place where they came from? That's right. Um, and sometimes it's a question, uh, maybe people's individual quality of life will be better if they come from, from uh, where they're coming from, but that could be harming the country in the process. So that means there could be some hard trade-offs. Uh, letting in half a million people from Mexico could be really good for those half a million people, but it could be and is driving down wages for people in construction and landscaping. So I think we have some difficult, um, difficult choices to make. I pitched the book really to progressives who tend to just have um, a knee-jerk reaction, the more the better. Progressives are, are really concerned about their fellow human beings, and they, they look out, they see a lot of poor people around the world, and they say, let's help those poor people, which is good. Uh, I think we should have that uh, desire, and, and we should act on it. 
but I don't really think bringing in more and more immigrants is the right way to act on that desire, because what it does is it furthers inequality and wage stagnation and um, harms working-class people here in the United States. Now, now many, many immigrants, and, and I know many myself, um, you know, have had to struggle. I mean, some have done very well, no question about it. Uh, some have better themselves, and, and, and certainly to the degree that they never would have been able to do so uh, in, in their home country for whatever reasons. Uh, but many struggle once they get here. Uh, is, there, is there some kind of a, uh, is, is there a, a marketing ploy going on? Are these people from across the globe? being told that the minute you, you, you know, lay your feet down on American soil, um, you know, all your problems will be solved, because that's, that's really not, that's not right, nor is it fair. That's true. And, you know, I've, I've um, interviewed a lot of immigrants for this book, and it's true. People are coming to this country to make a better life. Many of them do make a better life. They have more opportunities here. But it's also difficult for a lot of people. It's, it's, uh, I have a lot of respect for people who pick up and, and try to make life anew in a new country. And um, sometimes there's, there's really a lot of hardship. You, you miss your family. You miss the, the place you grew up in. So uh, it's, it's no bed of roses for immigrants either. One of the arguments that you make, and I think it's, I think it's a key argument, is the fact that we could easily flood the labor market, as opposed to the early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, we were a nation that was building, uh, not, not to say that we, we've stopped doing that, but we were building as an industrial force. Uh, a lot of that has changed drastically. Uh, a lot of it has gone um, overseas. A lot of it has been uh, uh, revamped. We're, we're a service economy today. But, but the point I'm getting at is we needed a lot of unskilled labor, and I think you talked about that at the opening, um, at the opening of the show. Uh, more importantly, uh, most immigrants, uh, and I may be naive on this, and, and, and you know, please, if I'm, if I'm out of line here, you know, get, get me back on track. Sure. My guess is that many of them are not coming over here as skilled uh, uh, employees. Uh, you know, they're looking, for, they're looking for the basic job, but they may not be here. And you need sustenance no matter where you go, no matter where you start a new life. You need the resources, you need an income to be able to sustain yourself. Um, so are they coming here with a, a misconception that there'll be plentiful jobs? Well, um, it's a tricky thing. I mean, there are about one and a quarter million immigrants coming in each year. Some of them are, are very highly skilled, a minority. Uh, we have engineers and doctors and computer programmers coming over. Um, and they're, they're quite highly skilled, and they're looking for certain kinds of jobs. But the majority of immigrants into the United States are less skilled and less educated than the Native population. And they, um, they really aren't... Um, uh, they're looking for, for uh, more jobs in, in uh, landscaping, construction, restaurant work, uh, working in hotels, cleaning up, whatever it might be. And really, that's one of the big problems uh, with our current immigration system. It's very much skewed toward bringing in less skilled, less educated immigrants. And we've seen changes in our economy in recent years, which, has, which have made it much harder for less skilled people to earn a decent wage. Um, there have been all kinds of technological changes which have dried up a lot of those jobs and um, other factors as well. So when you add in a flooded labor market, it just makes it that much harder for the people in our country already, uh, immigrants and uh, native-born citizens, who are struggling economically. Uh, so. Uh, one of the, the suggestions I make in the book is that we should cut back significantly on immigration, particularly among less skilled, less, less educated immigrants. And, and just so people get, you know, the, the, the Phil Kafaro is not out, uh, he's not anti-immigration, uh, you also uh, point out in the book that this flood of, of uh, let's call them, uh, you know, less skilled, less skilled uh, immigrants um, will certainly drive down wages. Now, this country has just seen a major debate on the minimum wage. Um, most people are on board with that, you know, certainly unskilled, uh, as you talked about, people doing, uh, you know, landscaping work, people working in 
hotels, supermarkets, uh, you know, deserve to be able to make at least a, a, a decent wage so they can support themselves. In the book, you talk about a flood of immigrants could easily once again uh, drive down wages, especially for, for that particular segment, uh, to the point where they're not able to sustain themselves. Is, is that a valid, rational argument? Well, I think it is. If you look at what the economists have to say, I mean, they, they talk about how labor markets work. And even if you're not an economist, if, if you look for a job, you know it makes a difference whether you are uh, looking for a job in a labor market where employers are looking for workers or you're looking for work in a labor market where there are lots of desperate workers and a lot fewer employers. So it certainly makes a difference. And that's one of the reasons, for instance, the, that the American Medical Association works so hard to limit the numbers of foreign doctors coming into the United States. So, you know, they, they know that it makes a difference um, whether you're flooding labor markets or not. And the same thing is obviously true if you're talking about construction or landscaping. Uh, I, I talked to dozens and dozens of people in construction, for instance, here in, in uh, northern Colorado, and they talk about being priced out of a job. They talk about how even in a time when there's been relatively booming construction, it's been very hard to see any kind of a raise in, in um, their wages. And it's because even though there's a boom in construction, there's even more of a boom in people coming in uh, from Central America and Mexico to take construction jobs. You know, and, and that's that's just basic uh, black and white economics. You have so many job openings, you have so many uh, so much demand, and once all of that has been filled, um, you know, the chances are there's not going to be a whole lot more. So when you have an influx of people, uh, you know, and, and that's a strong that's a very strong argument. Uh, you also talk in the book. Um, about towing the conservative line. I mean, you know, a lot of people say, well, geez, Phil, I mean, this isn't you. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're falling in line. You're, you're falling right in line here um, in step with the conservatives. Uh, and and I, I didn't take it that way. I think you were, you, I think you were making solid uh, arguments uh, for why uh, massive immigration uh, will maybe backfire on us. Uh, so, just, you, you know, I'm, I'm giving you, I guess what I'm saying is I'm giving you the chance. Defend yourself for those who think that you're, you're falling in line with conservatives. Of thinking. <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, that's, that's what you typically hear. And I'm a liberal Democrat, basically. That's, that's how I vote. That's how I've, uh, I've been involved in politics for over 30 years in, in the places that I've lived. So my, my values are really progressive values. You know, I, I'm, I believe in relative economic egalitarianism. I believe in security for for American workers. I believe in, in good wages for American workers. Uh, I believe in protecting the environment um, and getting political power back to common citizens. And from all these perspectives, uh, I find that mass immigration really limits our efforts to make progress on these things. We've talked a little about the economic aspects of this. Uh, the book also deals a lot with the environmental aspects. You know, if you want to uh, protect land, if you want to keep uh, the landscape from being paved over, if you want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the United States and globally, if you're concerned about protecting endangered species or keeping air and water clean, in all those ways, um, stabilizing the U.S. population is really key. And the good news is Americans have chosen to basically have enough kids to replace ourselves. But at the same time, our Congress has decided that they want to keep ratcheting up our population very quickly. So if we could cut back on immigration, again, within a few decades, we could stabilize our population and have a much better opportunity to deal with all our environmental problems. A couple of great arguments that I want to come back and just fill in some of the blanks with, because I think you make some good points there. But we're going to, we're going to pick up in a moment. But you're listening to The Public Eye right here on 90.5 WICN, Jazz Plus for New England. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Listen online at WICN.org. Good evening. If you're just joining us, I'm Al Vona, host of The Public Eye, welcoming you this Sunday evening. 
Um, we're talking about a very contentious issue, the immigration issue, uh, ongoing both uh, in Washington and certainly uh, in state houses uh, across the nation. But not only that, but right in, right in your own kitchen. Uh, many people feeling one way or the other, should we limit immigration? Should we uh, allow more immigrants into the country? And, and, and I suppose there are arguments on both sides of the, uh, of the aisle. But my guest today is a man who knows a little bit about that. He's the author of the new book, How Many is Too Many? Reducing Immigration. He's Phil Cafaro, philosophy professor at Colorado State University uh, and an old friend of WICN. Uh, had Phil back uh, from, I think, about two years ago, Phil, we had you on. Uh, right. on, on other issues and, and, and really cover them well. Uh, here's something else. Now, you just made a good point. Um, you get married. You know, you want to live the American dream. Uh, you get married. You raise a family. You buy a house. And you assume that, well, you know, I've, I've, I've achieved the things that mom and dad told me I could achieve. Um, and, and I've done well. Now, I want to do well by my children. Now, certainly none of us have a crystal ball. None of us can look 10, 20, 30 years down the line. But we certainly want to. And, and I see it every day. I mean, you know, uh, people are, are putting their kids in the you know sports and and education programs and obviously certainly schooling, um, all in the all in the hope that when their time comes that they'll be able to go out into the workforce and, and get a good job and support themselves and their families uh, and so that this can be uh, you know uh, this can be done all over again. Um, the argument that. Letting too many immigrants in the country um, when there are not even enough jobs for for our Native Americans, people born right here in this country, could certainly compel a lot of people. But you know what, Phil? You can make that argument in in, in front of an audience of people, and some of them will just, you know, they'll just uh, shoot you down and say, yeah, Phil, you don't know what you're talking about. There'll always be plenty of jobs. I don't believe that personally. I I think especially in this age of technology, um, a recent report that I read is many manufacturing jobs um, are are now being handled. And maybe they're more simplistic right now, but that doesn't mean that advancements couldn't change things. Computers and robots are doing the work of actual humans. So 10, right. 10 or 20 years from now, uh, you know, uh, e- even depending on where we are in terms of industry and, and manufacturing in this country, and I'm just using that as an example, there may be very little jobs uh, so that nobody gets any work. So it, th- that is a very ra- that's a very legitimate argument that, hey, should we watch out for our own first? I, I, I don't know. I mean, is that where you were coming from on that? Well, I think we we have a special responsibility to our fellow citizens. We have a special responsibility to our children. And you're absolutely right that the trends we've been seeing in recent decades and and the projections for where we're going are relatively clear. Um, We're moving relatively rapidly from from an economy where there were needs for, for lots of less skilled labor an economy where 50, 60 years ago, you could come out of high school and find a, a job that would allow you to support a family. And uh, that doesn't seem to be the case today. And I think we're moving more and more in that direction, where the good jobs, the well-paying jobs, will be fewer, they'll require more training, more education. Uh, that's what the economists tell us. So given that, we need to fashion an immigration policy that actually fits those trends. If we pursue an immigration policy uh, that fits what was happening in this country a hundred years ago, that's really a recipe for for problems for poor Americans. Because, you know, the reality is a lot of people now and 50 years from now aren't going to go to college. Not everybody can become an engineer. And We need to create an economy that works for all of us. That's why we need to reduce immigration. But, you know, I'm not so much arguing that we shouldn't care about people in other parts of the world. I think the United States is a wealthy country, and there there are kinds of foreign aid that we can do to help people in other countries. In the book, I talk about this a little bit and, and make the case that we really should try to help people in other countries live better lives in those countries. Uh, instead of imagining that by bringing everyone to the United States, we can solve the world's problems. Well, you know, that, that, that's a good point, because in, in, this, this is something that bothers me personally, that this, this term, uh, the haves and the have-nots. Uh, that's been bantered back and forth, and, and, and no question, it's a political ploy. It's been used on both sides of the aisle, Democrats versus uh, Republicans and, and, and liberals versus conservatives. Uh, you, know, you don't care about your fellow man, whether he's an immigrant or not. Um, let, let's put that aside for the time being. The fact of the matter is that um, you know we could do 
I, I think if you were to sit down with 100 immigrants from across the globe in a room and say, look, if you could stay in your own country and still benefit being able to keep a roof over your head, uh, feed and clothe your family, um, and, re- and live a relatively good life. I mean, you know, we're not all going to be driving Bentleys. We're all going to be living on Rodeo Drive. Uh, and I don't think that's necessarily what most people want. They just want to be able to uh, do better than where, perhaps they're, where they are currently. Uh, what is wrong with that argument in, in, in helping them in their, in their um, native countries as opposed to promising them something here and, and making it worse? I can't think of anything worse than being uh, six months in this country and all of a sudden hearing your congressman saying, well, you know, uh, my fellow, my, my fellow uh, congressman across the hall or across the aisle doesn't want you to have anything better. I mean, are we sending a bad message even for those who come here? Well, I think that's true. Now, now it is true that people are coming to this country, and they at least feel that it's, it's in their interest to do so. But again, when you talk to individual immigrants, um, a lot of them will say, boy, you know, my country, things are so corrupt there, uh, I just didn't see any way to get ahead. Or there's just so much unemployment, it, just, it was impossible for me to find a job there. So um, I think... <laughs> maybe not everybody, but probably a majority of immigrants, if they could actually have made a decent life for themselves in their home countries, they never would have been interested in coming to the United States. Some people are always going to be adventurous. They're going to want to go to a new place and, and, and have that adventure. But most of us really want security. We want safety. We want, uh, many of us, we want to be able to, to raise a family. And you're right. People aren't necessarily looking to get rich they're looking to lead a decent life and and the answer to that is to find a way for people in honduras and vietnam and and mexico to live decent lives in those countries now now, phil here's another um you got me thinking about something else uh that you get they get to this country now this again here's another divisive issue um you know those who weren't uh you know the parents weren't born here but the children were uh they can stay now they're automatically citizens uh free tuition in in, in certain colleges um you know uh, the the uh, the food stamp programs and everything else that goes on and let's let's be honest i mean i i, I want people to understand this if you've down on your luck um, and you've done nothing wrong, and you've worked hard all your life, uh, you know, you expect some kind of a safety net there. But do we sometimes tempt people to come in? Mean, you made a good argument that, okay, if things are so bad in their own country, even on their best day, they're never going to get any better than where they are. So obviously that's a strong motivation to come to this country. However, do we tempt people in some ways uh, by dangling all these all these perks in front of them as an enticement to come here, only to fall short on the on, on fulfilling the promise. Yeah, I think that can happen. Now, my experience, uh, and again, I've I've talked to quite a few immigrants. I don't get the sense that most of them are coming here for the safety net. I think they're coming here uh, to work. For the most part, they they work hard if they can, if they can find the work. Um, so. I don't think necessarily cutting back on the safety net is the answer here. I think the answer is to start taking our immigration laws more seriously, for a start, actually enforce them, uh, and enforce them on employers who hire people illegally. Mm -hmm. So I think once we got serious about penalizing employers who hired people without proper authorization, it would make it a lot easier to actually hold to whatever limits we choose. And um, and I also think one, one issue you brought up was this birthright citizenship issue. Uh, people can come across the border, they can fly into the United States, you can have a kid, and that kid is a U.S. citizen. That's very rare uh, around the world. Very few countries still allow that. In most countries, uh, you can only, uh, your, your child will only be a citizen if you yourself are a citizen of a country. And so I argue in the book that the United States should actually change that and uh, eliminate birthright citizenship for the children of non-citizens. Yeah, I think that's going to. I think that's going to continue to be a very, uh, a very contentious uh, issue because it already is. Um, you know, when you when you sit down to write a book like this, I mean, you know, it was a hot button issue to begin with. Obviously, it's something that 
certainly meant a lot to you. Uh, you spent enough time and resources researching it. Uh, was there anything? I mean, the, the, you know, it's a big issue. It, it goes to many different levels. It affects so many different people on so many different, um, you know, plateaus. But for you personally, when you finally sat back, you finished the book, you, you knew you had something good between the pages. Um, was there anything that stood out that, that in, in stark contrast to everything else that you knew beforehand? Uh, was there something that was absolutely shocking or something that, that really, um, stirred you? Yeah, uh, one thing that, that really jumped out at me, as part of this book, I tried to figure out, okay, how much of a difference will different immigration rates make in terms of the population of the United States a few generations from now? So I got together with some demographers and uh, worked on population projections out to the year 2100. And uh, the figures that, that we came up with were just astounding. It turns out that for every extra half a million people you allow into the United States each year, you're going to get about 72 million people, uh, more people living in the U.S. in 2100. So at, uh, at our current uh, immigration rate of one and a quarter million annually, the U.S. population is going to increase from 320 million today to 525 million mm. in 2100. That's, that's over 200 million more people, mostly due to immigration. Uh, if we pass something like the Senate's 2000, uh, 2013 immigration bill and increase immigration to about 2 million annually, we'd more than double our population in 2100 to 670 million. So when you start to see those figures, you get a sense of how quickly... Uh, immigration can drive population increase. That was an eye opener. And, and, and it certainly, and it goes back, and because we only got a couple of moments here, but just quickly, it, it goes back to your original premise that you know, if we had all the resources, if we had the op, you know, if we had a million acres per state, and, and there was plenty of uh, room for everybody, and the resources were, were unlimited. Um, you know, it, it'd be a weaker argument, but there, there, you know, it dries up at some point. And and whose whose life would no one's life will be a, a very quality life if a half a million people reside in this in the United States uh, without jobs, w- without the ability to do any better than where they came from, without being able to feed or clothe their families. Uh, so so it, it, it's it's reality, and uh, you know, uh, people need to go out and buy the book. It's how many is too many. Uh, the argument made by the author Phil Cafaro on uh, you know what what should be a a, a, a prudent policy for immigration and uh, how it'll affect people, especially in the future. Phil, if people want to get more information, post questions to you, and just find out about uh, your work, how might they do that? Well, uh, they can visit my website, uh, www.philipcafaro, P-H-I-L-I-P-C-A-F-A-R-O.com. Uh, to buy the book, they can go to Amazon.com or the University of Chicago Press's website. Yep. And uh, it's a great read. I mean, uh, whether or not immigration is big in, in, in your life right at the moment, uh, it could certainly affect your your, uh, your children, your children's children. Uh, I think it's something we all should have a good working knowledge of. Again, how many is too many? My guest today has been the author, Phil Cafaro. If you have any questions about the broadcast, you can certainly give us a call here at the studios at WICN. Our number is 508-752-0700. You can pose any comments, questions, or feedback to me directly. That's Al Vona, V-U-O-N-A at WICN.org. Or just go to our safe and secure website, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. That's WICN.org. For the public eye, this is Al Vona. Thank you.